Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for coming along this afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Sally Picton, and I am the RICUS Deputy Manager. And we're going to take a little look at um, how to interpret the RICUS reports. So report interpretation is a very important part of external quality assessment. Participation in EQA itself is not going to lead to an improvement in the quality of the analytical performance of the laboratory if the EQA results aren't understood and interpreted. And this requires conclusions to be drawn, corrective actions to be taken to improve, um, to fix any errors and to check the effectiveness of any of those corrective actions that have been taken. So much of the value of an EQA programme is going to lie in the report that the laboratory receives. It needs to be comprehensive, provide the lab with valuable information on their performance and be easy and quick to interpret. It's important that the data is simple to understand so laboratories can quickly identify tests that require performance improvement measures. So labs will be using EQA to monitor their performance and identify any problems which will help them to stimulate the improvement of their overall performance. And it is likely that during the course of participation in RICUS that the lab will have some, you will have some performance issues and may require guidance on report interpretation. So today we're going to have a look at some of the aspects of the report and how you can use those to interpret your results. Um, but also if you have further issues um, and aren't able to sort them out yourselves. We have a team of scientists here in the RICUS departments who will help with troubleshooting issues. So the RICUS reports are presented in a user-friendly format with one page allocated per parameter. And there are seven different sub-reports displayed on each of these um, analyte pages. And these provide the performance indicators and comparisons to allow easy interpretation of the results. So we're going to look at each of these seven subsections of the report very briefly, just to give you the overview of all aspects of the report. So the first section is the text section, which contains all the statistical information. At the very top, we have the analyte name and the lab's chosen unit. So the labs can all report results in their own units. So they don't have to do any conversions. We do all the conversions for them. Underneath this, you can see we have the breakdown of the different peer group comparisons. We have the all methods, which is indicated by the white box, the methods that the laboratory has chosen indicated by the green box and the instruments that the lab has chosen within that method group indicated by the blue box. Here you can see the number of results that have been used to calculate the mean for comparison. We have our CV, our uncertainty for this particular peer group, the SDPA, which is used to calculate some of our performance indicators and the number of results that have been excluded during the statistical processing. So in this instance, this lab is running the hexokinase method on a Roche Cobus C311 and there are 101 results were used to calculate this mean and 10 results have been excluded during the statistical processing. Underneath this, we have the your results section. So this shows the results the lab has returned and shows the comparison value that they're being compared against. The lab's result is always indicated by the black triangle and the mean for comparison is the same as in this section. So if the comparison is at the instrument level, as it is in this case, the little box is blue. If there were less than five results for your particular instrument, the comparison will move up to the method level and the box here would be green instead of blue. So we can see quickly and clearly that the mean for comparison for this particular sample is the instrument mean. In the RICUS reports, we have three performance indicators. We have the standard deviation index, the target score and the percentage deviation. And each of these shows um, a different way of comparing the lab's result to the mean for comparison. So the SDI is calculated using the SDPA, the target score is calculated using the TDPA, and we'll look a little more at the statistics. And if anyone wants further information about statistics, we can provide that after the webinar is finished. For each of the performance indicators, 
that we have, we also show the running means of each of these, which is the average of the last 10 samples. So our RMSDI is the running mean standard deviation index, and that's the average of the SDIs for this and the nine previous samples. And this allows labs to monitor their perform performance over a longer time period. The one thing to be careful of when using the running means is that the running mean SDI and the running mean percentage deviation can be both positive and negative values. And when you take an average of those, those positive and negative values will cancel each other out. So the performance over the in the running mean SDI and running mean percentage deviation may look slightly better than the actual performance is. So if you want to have a quick guide, if you always use the running mean target score, this will give you your best quick glance to see at your long term performance. The target score is always a positive value. Um, so it doesn't have this issue. We'll see the benefits of the running mean SDI and percentage deviation uh, later on. But if you want a quick glance to see how your tests are performing over the long term, then the running mean target score is the best one to use. So underneath this, we have the acceptable limits and performance status section. So currently um, we have actually removed biological variation values from the report because um, there has been some uncertainty as to the previous biological variation values and how they were calculated. So um, there are various different studies being done currently to try and evaluate new ways of calculating biological variation, um, but those are um, ongoing and are causing the variation to change week by week and month by month for different analytes in different matrices. So at the moment we have removed the biological variation, but if a decision is made on the best way to calculate those, then we'll add that back in again. We show then also the acceptable limits for performance that the lab is being compared against. This will always be defaulted to say RICUS, which is the RICUS TDPA or target deviation for performance assessment for this particular analyte. In this instance, it's 4.5%. And if there is any per performance, so if you're a field on any of the performance indicators, then it's indicated here underneath. So you can see here we have our three performance indicators are all listed. The next section we have is the histogram section, and this provides a method and instrument comparison. So in the histogram, you can see the breakdown of all the results that have been returned for this sample. The colours here you can see match the colours in the text section right at the top. The white shows the all methods, the green shows the lab's particular chosen method and the blue section shows the instrument the lab has chosen. So here you can see the Roche Cobus is fitting nicely in the middle of this histogram. Again across the bottom you can see the concentrations um, of the results and they're again shown in the lab's, laboratory's own unit. And the black triangle again represents where the laboratory's result sits within this peer group. So here you can see this lab's performance is very good and it's sitting right in the middle of the histogram. The histogram can also be used and you can see clearly in the histogram if there's any kind of method or instrument bias. So in this example you can see that the, both the method and the instrument have a positive bias when compared to the overall results returned. So in this instance, we would normally recommend that laboratories contact the distributor supplier of their um, reagent um, to discuss possible issues and why the results um, are much higher than the overall results from other tests. Um, the laboratory's comparison will be within this peer group, so the lab's performance will be OK if they fall within this, but it's just the fact that the entire instrument group has a bias. And this is then an area that would need to be referred back to the instrument or reagent manufacturer. Um, at the bottom of the report, we have the multi method statistics section, and this enables an assessment of the performance of each of the methods used for this particular test. So, for any methods um, which have a peer group that have at least two results in them, they will appear in this particular table. Um, and you can see then the mean CV and uncertainty for each of the different methods for which results have been returned. So the uncertainty is calculated for each method. Um, we have to calculate it for each particular peer group. And the CV is just a standard CV. It's the calculated standard deviation divided by the mean for comparison times 100, which is just 
routine CV. So we have four charts down the right hand side of the report. The first of these is the Levy Jennings chart, which um, you will all be very used to in the laboratory setting because you would use these to monitor your IQC as well. So the chart displays the 20 samples. Um, the current result is always displayed on the right hand side of the report and then the previous samples go back in a chronological order. The sample numbers are shown along the bottom. And along the top of the report, you can see the mean for comparison for the previous samples. In front of the number, you can see here there is a little I, and that indicates that the comparison has been at the instrument level. If there are less than five results in your instrument level, the comparison moves up to the method level. And instead of the little I, you would see an M appear here. So instead of this little I, you'll see an M. And I have an example of that um, to show you. Uh, later on. So the Navy Jennings chart covers a three SD limit and there's shading to indicate the performance. So the white is the best, pink is OK and anything in the red zone is deemed to be unacceptable performance. Acceptable performance is an SDI less than two. So here you can see at minus two and plus two. So anything that falls outside an SDI limit of two is going to be in the poor performance. So where we show the sample numbers along the bottom, there are other, um, you can see here that there are letters have replaced some of the numbers. So in this instance, the N indicates that no result was returned for the sample. And you can see there's no black dot on the report here to correspond with an SDI for that sample because there's no result. You can also here see a C, which shows that the lab have correct the result. So maybe there was a transcription error and they've typed in the result incorrectly, maybe put a decimal point in the wrong place. And the lab can correct the result and it shows along here as a C. There is also an R, but I don't have an example here, but you can also have an R here, which would show that the results have been removed. And that can be done if the sample has been reconstituted incorrectly or if the results for the wrong sample have been entered. And that means that your long term performance and the performance on the end of cycle reports would not be affected um, by that mistake because that's not um, an analytical mistake. It's a pre analytical mistake, so it, we wouldn't want the performance of the labs to be affected by that. So you may also see an R along the bottom of the reports to show that the results for that sample for all parameters have been removed. Our second chart is the target scoring chart. And this provides a visualization of a laboratory's target scores. So again, we plot the last 20 target scores. The accepted performance for the target score is a target score of greater than 50. So the target scores will range from 10 to 120. So at the top here from 100 to 120, you can see is an excellent performance. 70 to 100 is good. 50 to 70 acceptable and anything under 50 is deemed to be unacceptable performance. Again, the current sample is always on the right hand side and the previous samples are plotted in chronological order. And at the top of the chart, we state the target deviation for performance assessment for each parameter. Target deviation performance assessment is set um, using historical data and the homogeneity, stability and shipping data that we get when we test each particular lot. And these are set to have per performance for 10% of labs. So we believe that 90% using that target value, 90% of labs will be able to meet that target value and therefore have a, an acceptable performance. Um, and that value is reviewed each year and updated as necessary. Um, I say it's because it's based on historical performance. So if the performance of the labs improved, the TDPA will get smaller um, and labs should still be able to achieve that target value. There is a lot of statistical information on the RICUS report and there isn't really time to go into it today, but there is a brochure called the Evaluation of Performance, which is available. And if you require more information on the statistics used to calculate the reports, then please contact your local Randox representative and they will be able to get you that file. Um, and then if you have any questions, you can come back and ask any additional questions. So we have two percentage deviation charts. The first of these is the percentage deviation by sample chart, and this can help to identify trends and shifts in performance over time. 
So again, we plot the percentage deviation for the last 20 samples. The acceptable limits in this instance are set, they would default to the RICUS TDPA value, but can also be set um, if there are different official criteria defined by governing bodies or company specific requirements, such as CLIA, then these um, acceptable limits can be changed. So again, the chart is color coordinated. Anything in the white section is deemed to be acceptable and anything in the red sections is deemed to be unacceptable performance. And again, here you can see um, the TDPA here is 6.3. And if you look at the chart here, you can see the acceptable limit here is a 6.3. So anything within the white is acceptable, anything in the red is unacceptable. The one thing to be aware of with this chart is that this scale will change and will be different for each parameter. So the scale that that is set at will depend on the target deviation for performance assessment for each parameter and also the lab's performance. So if you have a sample which has a poor performance and ends up with a much larger uh, percentage deviation, adjust and you would find it, the le limits will stay at the same level, but they will move further in on the chart so that the poor performance can be um, shown on the chart. So always check the percentage deviation scale here because this will be different for each parameter on your report. So the results for each individual sample, the percentage deviations are plotted by the black circle. You can see also there is a white circle and the white circle indicates the running mean value. So this is your average over your last 10 samples and allows you to monitor trends over time. So this can be a good indication of your overall performance when all results are on the same side of the mean. So this is an indication of a potential systematic error and here you can see using the running mean that the lab's performance is running at about minus 5%. So the lab can see clearly they have a 5% bias. It's more difficult to interpret when the results are both above and below the line because this average value will cancel out. So here you can see the lab have had a low result and another low result and here there's a high result. So these high and low cancel each other out. So the overall performance will appear better than these erroneous results would, um, would show. So there are advantages to using the running mean, but it needs to be used in context with the results, the individual results for each sample that have been returned. So in this instance where you can see that there is a lot of variability between the pos pos positive results and the negative results, the running mean target score is a better indicator because it's always a positive value. The other issue that you may have with the running mean um, is that if one poor performance can lead to a running mean being poor for the next 10 samples until this result is no longer included. So if you look at the results for each individual sample for the lab, you can see their performance is very good and it's well within the acceptable limit. But if you just looked at the running mean for any of these samples, it's deemed to be unacceptable. It's in the red zone but the actual performance for each of those samples is OK. So if you had just looked at the running mean, you would think the performance for this particular test was bad. But actually, when you look at the specific results, the performance is well within acceptable limits. And here, once the result, this bad result is no longer included in the 10 samples, you can see the running mean is back up to being very close to the zero line. And this is a more true reflection of the lab's performance. The second percentage deviation chart is percentage deviation by concentration, and this can allow a rapid assessment of any concentration related biases. So the result for the current sample is indicated by the black square and the grey circles indicate the previous results. So this chart will only show results at the same comparison level. So if your comparison for this particular sample is at the instrument level, then this will show any other results that are at the instrument level comparison. If there are less than five, or maybe there's only six or seven instruments on the market, so the number who have joined the scheme aren't very high, the performance, depending on who returns, may vary between the instrument level and the method level until we have sufficient numbers of instrument users. In that case, 
you may not see all 20 results on this chart. It will only show the results at the same comparison level as the current sample. So in this example, you see the lab has a good performance at the high concentration. They're nice and close to the target line. But at the lower concentrations, you can see here you've got very building performance from plus 40 percent to minus 30 percent. So at this low concentration, the lab is not in control of this particular test. Um, so as part of the EQA, you should be covering both all the clinical decision levels. Um, so we cover a higher range than you would cover with your internal controls. Usually you will only have two levels of internal control. Um, here in this instance, the lab may only be running one level at the higher level, and this level at the lower concentrations is, is not being monitored using internal quality controls, which may explain the very performance in the EQA. Here in this instance, you can see that the lab's performance at the lower and the mid concentrations are fine, but at the higher concentrations, the lab now appear to have a positive bias. You can see here there is one result that is at a lower um, percentage deviation, but we would need to look historically and see when that falls. That could be 20 samples ago, um, and then this is the, the current performance, reflection of the current performance. So each chart can give you a lot of information, but each chart needs to be taken in context. Um, so there's a lot of information on the reports as long as you know where to look. So hopefully by the end of today, you'll understand a lot more of the information that you can get from your RICUS report. At the end of the report, we have the summary page. So this is an overall view of the results for each analyte that you're registered for, and it compares your result and the mean for comparison. We have our three performance indicators, our SDI, our percentage deviation, and our target score, and our three running means, so the average of the last 10 samples. Any poor performance is highlighted, so if there is a failure on any of the three performance indicators, it will be bold and underlined on this summary page. And if all three performance indicators fail, as you can see here, then the red triangle will appear on the report. So the triangle only appears when all three limits are exceeded. So if your standard deviation is greater than two, your target score is less than 50, and the percentage deviation is greater than the acceptable limit of performance. So if you fail in all three reports, then you get the red triangle. So the summary page can be very handy as, as lab managers and uh, lab supervisors and workers in the lab. You are very busy. We're aware of that. So the summary page will give you a fast at a glance performance to see how you've performed for this sample. So you'll be able to see straight away any analytes that have the red triangle and therefore have failed on this current sample. And those are the analytes that you really need to look at more in depth immediately. You can see the performance for all your other tests as well, but this will allow you a quick assessment of any analytes that have failed performance and therefore the ones that should be investigated. So the three performance indicators that we have on RECUS, we've already said, are the percentage deviation, the standard deviation index and the target score. And each of these is the difference between your result and a target or an assigned value. So the percentage deviation is your bias relative to the mean. Your target score is your percentage deviation relative to a target deviation, the target deviation for performance assessment. And your SDI is your bias relative to the SDPA or the standard deviation for performance assessment. So this is how each of these is calculated. So the SDI is your result minus the mean for comparison divided by the standard deviation for performance assessment. And then we use that percentage deviation to calculate the target score. Assessment. So we divide TDPA by percentage deviation, multiply by 3.16, take the log 10 of that and multiply by 100 to get the target score. So some people get very frustrated with logarithmic calculations. They don't like doing them. So the take home message is this little box at the bottom. So if your percentage deviation of this particular sample is equal to the target deviation for performance assessment, your target score will equal 50, and that is the lowest acceptable target score. If your percentage deviation is greater than the target, so you have not met the criteria we have set, 
your target score is less than 50 and that is deemed to be poor performance. If, however, the percentage deviation deviation for performance assessment, your target score will be greater than 50 and your performance is acceptable for this particular sample. So our limits, the SDI should be less than two, target score should be greater than 50 and the percentage deviation should be less than the acceptable limits, the RICUS TDPA or if some other limit has been chosen than that limit. So this is just to show you in the results section where each of these performance indicators lies. And here again on the summary page, you can see, so we have our three performance indicators listed here. Okay, so we're going to look at some examples of RICUS reports and look at um, how we can interpret the information that is on each of these reports. So I've just received my RICUS report. What's the first thing I should do? Well, I would say the first thing to do is turn to the summary page and have a look at that because that will give you the overall view of your performance for all your parameters for this particular sample. So here we have an example of a summary page. And here you can see that there are a few parameters that we have an issue with, but this allows me to see all my parameters from albumin through to uric acid all on one page so I can see quickly and clearly any issues that I've had for this particular sample. So which parameter or parameters have the worst performance? So when we want to look for our performance, our red triangle here indicates a problem as we've just said. So when you feel all three performance indicators, you get a red triangle. So here for urea, you can see that the percentage deviation and the target score are both bold and underlined, but the SDI is just less than two. So in this instance, there's no red triangle, but we can still see here on the summary page that there was an issue with this particular sample and the performance hasn't been very good. But I can see straight away using my red triangle that these four analytes are the ones that I need to look at I need to investigate what has happened with those. So I say we look for our red triangles and we look then to see our three performance indicators and we can see these are all underlined where we have an issue and that's what we need to investigate. So just to reiterate, your per performance would be an SDI greater than two, a target score less than 50, and a percentage deviation greater than the acceptable limit of performance. So if we actually flip it over now and have a look at the parameters that have performed best for the sample, we can see that too clearly on this summary page. So firstly, we'll look at our SDI. So here you can see the two, I've highlighted the two lowest SDIs. For CK05 and for potassium, we have an SDI of minus 0.03. So the better the SDI, the closer it is to zero. It doesn't matter if it's a positive value or a negative value, it's the closest one to zero. So in this example, potassium has the lowest SDI and therefore is the best performing parameter if we looked at the SDI. So if we look at the percentage deviation, again, we're looking here for the lowest value. And again, it doesn't matter if it's a positive or negative value, it's which one is closest to zero. So again, if we look at CK total and potassium, we can see these are the two lowest percentage deviations. And again, potassium has the lowest percentage deviation at minus 0.1. So our third performance target score. So if we look at this, we can see um, which of these analytes has the highest target score. So the range for target scores goes from 10 to 120. So 120 is the highest target score that you can get on a RICUS report. And here you can see we have three analytes. We have bilirubin total, CK total and potassium that all have a target score of 120, which is the best, the highest value that you could get. So again, this is just to highlight that on the summary page, you can see an overview of your performance for all your parameters, um, the good, the bad, 
hopefully there are no ugly ones, um, but this allows you to very quickly see your overall performance for this sample. So which of these parameters shows the best long-term performance to date? So in order to look at long-term performance, we need to look at the running means, which is the average of the last 10 samples. So for the quick assessment, the easiest one, best one to look at is the running mean target score, as we've already discussed, because it's always a positive value and therefore is not affected by any differences between negative and positive values that we would see with the SDI and the percentage deviation. So if we look down our list of running mean target scores, you can all have a look along with me while we're, before I move on to the next slide. So hopefully you can see which parameter there has the highest running mean target score. It's alkaline phosphatase. Alkaline phosphatase has the best performance to date based on the running mean target score, which is 109. If, however, you look at the result for the current sample, the target score for this is only 64. So something has happened over time. The performance was better in the past, but for this current sample, the performance is not as good as it has been in the past. So again, this is something that labs should be aware of and would need to look at to see, has there, see the reason for the drop off in their performance. Maybe there's a trend they can see developing um, for this parameter. Um, but that's an area that we need to look at when you can see that your historical performance has been that good and your result for your current sample is not that good. You need to investigate what has changed over the course of time. So this is another example um, of when you might have an issue if you just use the running mean percentage deviation. In this instance, you can see the running mean percentage deviation for the lab is 3.4%. But the percentage deviation of the current sample was 8.9% and you can see that here in the red zone. But here you can see if you just look at the white line, the running mean is always falling nicely within the white levels in the white limits. Um, so if you just looked at the running mean performance, you would uh, it, the performance appears to be good. But when you look at the individual results, you can see that they go from low to high to low to high. And there are some in the middle, but there are quite a few results that fall outside the acceptable limits. So the running mean percentage deviation and the running mean SDI can give you a good indication, but it needs to be taken in context. Um, if you just look at it alone, um, the information may be slightly misrepresented based on the lab's erratic performance. So I'm going to show you another summary page just for a second, and you have a quick look at it and see if you can figure out what might be wrong with the sample. So when we get a summary page and there are so many red triangles, um, we're going to look at it and go, uh oh, something bad has happened. So when you see this number of red triangles, we would normally assume that there is an issue, a sample related issue. So we need to investigate what type of sample related issue it might be. So we need to look at our different performance indicators and see if we can spot any trends or anything that um, stands out on the report. So if we look at our performance indicators, I'm just going to leave the slide up for a second to give you a chance to have a little look. So we want to look at our SDI, our percentage deviation and our target scores and see if you can spot anything unusual. So if you look at the percentage deviation column, you can see that the values are all fairly similar. They're all minus values and they're all slightly low, you know, about 10%, between 5 and 10%. And this would lead us to suspect that there's been a reconstitution error. So maybe instead of adding 5 mils, the lab have added 5.5 or 6 mils, they've misset the pipettes and they've added the wrong amount of material. Occasionally also with things like specific proteins, which is a liquid sample, we do occasionally get labs who um, add additional liquid to the sample um, by accident because they're in the mindset of reconstituting their other controls. So um, they've added liquid into the li already liquid controls. Um, so in this instance, where the percentage deviations are very similar, this would lead us to suspect a reconstitution error. Okay, so at another report where something has gone wrong. So here again, you can see that almost all of the parameters are flagged with a red triangle. 
This time, if you look at the performance indicators, you can see that there is a lot of variability. So all the target scores, except this one, Billy Ribbon, um, are all at the lowest value. They're all 10. And um, you can see the percentage deviations. Some are high, some are low. And um, we go from there's 329 uh, down to minus 4.3 and up to 109, 125. So you can see that the percentage deviations are all over the place. They're all up and down and very, very different. So in this instance, we can say that the results for the wrong sample have been submitted. So it can either be that the lab have um, entered the results under the wrong sample number or have run the wrong sample at the time and therefore put the wrong results in against the particular sample. Um, so again, the lab will need to go away and investigate whether it's the wrong sample has been run or whether somebody has taken the wrong results or the right results, but entered them under the wrong sample number. Uh, so the lab will need to investigate what has happened there. But the take home message here is when you look at your summary page, if you see this number of red triangles or most of the parameters being highlighted, uh, then you need to establish it's most likely a sample issue and you need to establish um, what that issue is, whether it's a reconstitution or whether it's the wrong sample that has been run. So we're going to look at a different summary page. So in this summary page, you can see that only one parameter is flagged. So we know it's not an issue with the sample. It's just an issue with this one parameter. And this one is methotrexate. So in order to find out what might be wrong with this sample, the best thing to do is look at the individual parameter page. So this is the individual parameter page for methotrexate. So again, you can see the poor performance. The SDI is greater than three. The target score is 10, which is the lowest score. The percentage deviation is outside the acceptable limits. Um, and you can see these are all big high numbers, which is bad, and the target score is low. If you look at the text section, here you can see the lab have entered a result of 4,560, and the mean for comparison is 4.435. So you can see straight away there's a difference of about a thousand between these two results. And there are two reasons, two possible reasons for this. The lab have either registered for the wrong unit or there has been a transcription error. So how do we differentiate between these? So when we look at the charts at the Levy Jennings chart, you can see that for all the previous samples, the lab's performance has been very good. It's usually within SD range, apart from this one sample. Um, and it's just this current sample. So this would imply that it's more likely to be a transcription error than the lab being registered for the wrong unit. If the lab was registered for the wrong unit, you would expect to see this kind of poor performance for many of the previous samples as well. So in this instance, the most likely cause is a transcription error. So when the lab got the report, they went and had a look um, at the printer and in the result should have been 4.56, not 4,560. So this little bit at the top is just a screenshot of the late and corrected request form that can be sent when there's been a transcription error. And so here you can see the lab have said what the correct result should have been and submitted the analyzer printout, which allows us then to update and correct that erroneous result, which means the lab's long-term performance won't be affected and the end of cycle report results won't be affected when we look at the averages over the cycle. So this is just a picture of the form that uh, can be filled in to, and be sent to us. This is available on RICUSNET. Um, when you log into RICUSNET, you'll see um, that there is a section for downloading this particular form. So the top section is the laboratory information and the reason for the request that you're submitting. So you can either request to update your assay details um, if you reconstituted the sample in the wrong volume or incorrectly, incorrect sample reconstituted, that's the same. Sorry, so it's one for reconstitution error and one if you've submitted the wrong results. So we can get the results removed, which would be that R I talked about earlier on the charts. If there's been a transcription error, this is the section, you, we would correct the result but a new report will be issued in these cases. Um, and this last one is the request of submission of a late result. 
And that will only be accepted if there's been an error on Randox's part in getting the samples out to you. So generally, if for reports, it will be these top four options that would be um, used. But if you're unsure about this, then you can get more information and say this form is available on Wikisnet, so you can download it and have a look. And if there are any questions, then you can um, contact your Randox representative. So if we have a look at our next example, so this is just to highlight again the text and how these results are calculated. So the number in this N column, N stands for the number of results that are used to calculate the mean for comparison. So whenever we we um, look at gross outliers and we remove gross outliers from the data set. So somebody who is in the wrong volume or in the wrong unit. So if that previous example, if the labs was in the wrong unit and when they submit that result of 4,000, that result will be excluded as a gross outlier value and therefore won't, take, won't be used in the statistical calculations of the mean. So we remove our gross outliers and then we do statistical processing. So we use Chauvenet's criterion um, and then a 95th percentile to um, narrow the data and set these means for comparison. So during the gross outlier processing and the statistical processing, 121 results were removed and then 1,679 results were used to calculate the mean for comparison. For this lab's particular instrument, there are five results were returned and no results were excluded during the statistical processing. So here at the SDPA, you can see that there's a little A beside the value. So what does this little A represent? So this is taken from our standard. So um, RICUS is an accredited scheme to set ISO 17043, which is the accreditation for proficiency testing providers. And one of the clauses says when a consensus value is used, so that's what we're using when we're using the results from everybody, that's consensus value. The proficiency testing provider shall document the reason for that selection and shall estimate the uncertainty of the assigned value as described in the plan for the proficiency testing scheme. Which means that for each particular mean for comparison for each peer group that we have, we have to calculate the uncertainty. So the uncertainty is calculated as 1.25 times the standard deviation, and that's the calculated standard deviation from the consensus of the results, and divide that by the square root of n. And this must be less than 0 0.3 times the SDPA, or it's deemed to be um, significant, and therefore we need to adjust. So once we compare our SDPA to the calculated uncertainty, if the uncertainty is greater than 0.3 times the SDPA, it's considered to be significant and must be combined. So the SDPA adjusted, which is what the little a stands for, and this is just how you pull any data sets. So you take your uncertainty and square it, you take your SDPA and square it, add them together, and then take the square root, and that gives you your adjusted SDPA. If your uncertainty is less than 0.3 times the SDPA, it's considered to be insignificant. And in that case, the SDPA adjusted is just the existing SDPA. So that's where that little A appears on the report. So we're going to take a little look at some more information that's on the charts. So here again, we're moving back to the Levy Jennings chart. I mentioned when we looked at it earlier that across the top, you can see in front of the value, there's either an I or an M, or some of you may have noticed in the methotrexate example, there's a little A in front of these. And again, this indicates the level of the mean for comparison. So the M is for the method, the I is for the instrument, and the A is if the comparison is done at the all methods level. So as I mentioned, when we looked at the percentage deviation chart, only results at the same comparison level are shown at the percentage deviation chart. So we've said these charts can show 20 samples. Here I've highlighted that there are two samples that the lab did not return a result for. So the lab have returned 18 out of the last 20 samples in this example. If you count the little blobs on the report here, there are only 14 results displayed in this percentage deviation um, by concentration chart. And that's because the results that are at the method level, the ones that have the M in front of them, are not included because the current sample has a comparison level at the instrument level. So only the instrument level results 
are shown then on this percentage deviation by concentration chart. OK, so we're going to look at another example. What do you think is most, the most likely to be the reason for the poor performance of albumin? So this, we've looked at our summary page and there's only an albumin flag. So we've turned to our analyte page and this is the result. So again, in this instance, you can see that the result the lab have submitted is 100 times the result of the mean for comparison. So again, we need to establish, is it a transcription error or is it a unit issue? So here I have shown you the different units that are available for albumin. And this, the correction factor is here in the bracket. And depending on the result, um, so depending on the unit, so this is the unit the lab is registered for, and here you can see the mean for comparison, which matches this. If the lab is registered for some of the other units, these are the mean for comparisons that they would get. And you can see none of these match the result the lab has returned. So again, we can establish that there's been a transcription error. And again, the lab has forgotten to put the decimal point in between the four and the two. So the result should have been 4.25, in which case their performance would have been much better and they would not have an SDI of 2000, which is considerably greater than our acceptable limit of two. So we've got an example for CK total. So what do you think could be the issue with this report? So you can look here at all the charts and straight away you can see we have a big, big, big issue. This is an example of where I've mentioned that this chart can change depending on the lab's performance. So here you can see the TDPA at 7.8 has now become this tiny little white bit in the middle because all the lab's results that have been returned have been up at over 100% um, of a percentage deviation. So we can see here if we look at the just top of the report, we can see that since the lab started, they have had poor performance. So it would be preferable if they'd looked at the report earlier and seen it after the first or second samples. Um, but once you see the five samples, you can see quite clearly we have an issue here. So it turns out the lab had registered for the wrong unit. So not the wrong unit, the wrong temperature. For the enzymes, we also, in addition to having the unit, we also look at the temperature the test is being run at. Um, and the lab, whenever they're registering for any enzymes on any of the RICS programmes, they must indicate the temperature that the test is being run at. So within RICUS, we mentioned earlier that labs register for their own particular unit. They don't have to do um, conversions to the SI unit. So we have the unit correction factors set for the different parameters and we convert the results ourselves. Um, but we also do the same for the temperature. So in this instance, the lab had registered at 25. So you can see the correction factor here was 2.353. If you looked at their result, you can see that that is the difference between the mean for comparison and the lab's result. So when we change the lab to having a temperature of 37 degrees, their performance then improved. So incorrect registration accounts for a very large percentage of RICUS performance queries, and it's in everyone's interest to ensure that participants are registered in the correct method for the first time. So if you're changing um, your test um, or you're changing your instrument, and you're then going to be using a new reagent and you're not sure what the method group should be, then it's better to contact the RICUS department and get confirmation from them as to the correct assay details that you should be registering for. Um, because not only will registering for the wrong assay details affect your performance, it could also affect other labs' performances as well, and you wouldn't want that. So it's very important to make sure that labs are registered correctly whenever they join. So what should we do when we receive a report with poor performance? So EQA results need to be analysed alongside IQC. Sometimes, as with some of those examples, you can see straight away that the performance, it's not a performance issue, it's a transcription error or a problem with the sample. But what if we um, do have a persistent poor performance that we're seeing on our EQA reports? We need to compare that to our IQC data. So there are some um, questions that you need to ask whenever you're looking at your IQC data. So these are the, the, the sort of first things we'll ask whenever we get any performance queries. So the first thing 
is to make sure the lab is registered correctly. That's our first step. Um, and then we'll ask to see the IQC. And then we ask some particular questions about the IQC. So does the lab see a similar performance in their IQC results? How often is IQC run and at what concentrations? Who is the supplier? Is it the instrument manufacturer or the lab using a third party um, control? Are the targets set? Are they a running mean um, target or is it a fixed target? Does it come, was it set by the lab? Does it come from the manufacturer? Um, how wide are the IQC ranges compared to the EQA? IQC ranges are generally set to be a much wider range than you would get with EQA performance. So it's important to compare the two. And the other things we would want to check, especially if there's been a sudden shift in performance, is have any changes been made to the instrument? Any new reagents? Any new control locks? Has the instrument been recalibrated? Has there been any maintenance or service performed on the instrument? Um, so the IQC would tend to be if we see trends in the performance, and these changes will be if there's a sudden shift in the performance that you would be seeing. So for our analysis of our IQC data, we need to compare like for like. If we want to compare our IQC and our EQA, the easiest way to do that is to convert your IQC to a percentage deviation for comparison. So here's an example. My IQC is perfect, but I have a constant negative bias on RICUS. So this is for the chemistry and this was um, the lab's report. So the lab sent us in their IQC information. They provided us with six months of raw results. The target used was from an insert sheet. The mean was very close to the target and the CV of the results was always less than 0.5% and no result was ever outside the one acceptable range. So if you were looking at that and that was what you were able to say about your IQC, you'd be thinking, yep, my IQC is great. I have no problems here at all. Happy days. And that's fine. So what we did was we converted the lab's results, their raw results, into the percentage deviations from the target. For their level one control, the average percentage deviation was minus 1.6%. And for the level two, the average was minus 1.6%. So when you plot those values onto the percentage deviation chart on RICUS, you can see that actually the lab's IQC data does match this negative bias that the lab is seeing on RICUS. So although the IQC results were well within the acceptable limit, they were still running with the negative bias that the lab was seeing on the RICUS report. So the IQC results show the same deviation from the mean for comparison as the RICUS results, and the larger acceptable IQC had given a false perception of accuracy and precision. So the lab was happy, but they just hadn't noticed that with their IQC, they were still running with the same negative bias. So we always need to make sure we establish a root cause. So whenever we have a problem and we have a performance issue, we need to try and find out what happened and then find out why that happened and then find out why that happened. So here you can see we have, um, we call it the five whys. So you need to find out what happened, why did it happen, how can it be prevented from happening again, and how do we know we made a difference? So we need to establish our root cause. We need to have um, corrective actions for our root cause. We need preventative actions, and then we need effectiveness checks to make sure that we have um, eliminated the true root cause. So it's not just a case of finding out what happened. You need to establish why it happened. This table just shows um, the percentages of um, a number of failed challenges. And these are from um, four different reports that were published. And this was just summarized in this table. So you can see um, about 30%, and this one was up to 50% of the results were incorrect methods being registered. Um, clerical issues, which would be your transcription errors. Um, and you can see here there's 20% of unexplained. So these are really the ones that are going to cause you problems and that are going to need much more investigative work. So within the RICUS brochure, there is a monitoring EQA performance guide. And this just gives you a little flow chart to help you um, try and establish um, what the issue might be. There's also a little checklist that can be very helpful um, in going through and checking that everything is as it should be. Um, and if you, you may find as you go through that you can establish what the problem uh, might be. So say those are both available in the RICUS brochure, which is available on the Randox website. Um, so it's easily accessible.
And just to finish off, um, as I have about two minutes left, I have one final example for you. So we have one final report page. And here again, you can see that bile acids is the only parameter that is flagged. So we want to look at the individual period, the individual parameter page. So here we have our example for bile acids. So here you can see the lab's performance was OK. Everything was within the two USD. So they do have a positive bias. You can see it here. Um, they do have a positive bias, but the results have all been within the acceptable limit. The black line on the report here indicates a change to the lab's assay details. And you can see that the sample after that change was made, then the lab has this poor performance. So first thing we want to look at is the lab registered with the correct assay details. So we checked with them, the assay details are correct. The black line indicating the change in the assay details was a change of reagent manufacturer, but the method was the same. So the um, peer groups of the method and the instrument stayed the same. The issue is just with the current sample. There is no issue with the previous samples. So we want to check the IQC. So the lab sent us the IQC data and whenever they changed to this new reagent, they had seen a shift in their QC data as well. So they were running three levels and you can see as the concentration levels increased, so did the change that they had seen in their IQC data. So it went up by 4%, 5% and 15%. If you look at the mean for comparison for this particular sample, it was 104, which again is much higher than the level of QC running, but again is a level that um, needs to be run to cover the full clinical range and clinical decision levels. So what would your next, next course of action be? Where else might you look on the report to try and figure out what the issue might be? So if we look at our charts, our charts are usually easy for um, identifying issues. So again, the Levy Jennings chart along the top shows the means for comparison. Um, so here, if I make it a little bit larger for you to see, you can see the previous samples were all 48, 25, so they were much lower, and this current sample was 104. So again, it was a much higher level sample. If we look at the percentage deviation by concentration chart, again, we can see our normal levels, and we can see that this is a much higher level sample. And again, we have a much higher percentage deviation for this current sample. So you may have noticed in the histogram that there is a bimodal split here in the results from the instrument. Um, so the lab had been recommended by Beckman to change to using the Sentinel reagents. So we contacted all these labs and some of these to confirm and all the labs in this little higher group were all using Sentinel reagents and all been asked by Beckman to move to the Sentinel reagent um, group. So we then went back to contact Beckman and to see why there was a difference in their old kit and then the new kit that they were recommending. Um, so we did some work with Beckman and were able to resolve it and the Sentinel um, people got a new method group set up for them, which helped them and to improve their performance. Um, thank you very much for your attention this afternoon.